Hello, my name is Richard Lund, and I'm here to invite you along in my journey to live 100 healthy years. Now, I've been working on the fasting mimicking diet, redneck version, which is my own invention, only because I didn't have the money to pay uh, El Nutra for their wonderful product, Prolon, which I would encourage you to use if you have the money. And if you don't, well, maybe you'll be back, back in the pack with me trying to figure this stuff out. So we were talking about glycerin before and glycerin, I, I bought a bottle of it and, uh, and I was trying to use it last month. I, I've done it two months and I'm gonna continue. In fact, next month, look for my month three version of the Fasting Mimicking Diet Redneck version. But I bought some of this and I used it in my water. And so I had a bottle of water and I took four tablespoons and put it in the water and I realized that I miscalculated. I should have put maybe one tablespoon in. So next month, I'm going to use one tablespoon. So we've got glycerin. And what is glycerin, you might ask? <laughs> I wanted to find out. If you remember, I've talked about um, triglycerides. Now, my triglycerides have been high. Now they're coming down, which is kind of nice. But what is a triglyceride? It's the way that most of the fats or lipids are carried around in the body. We could also call these fatty acids. And glycerol is the upper portion, the, the coat hanger part. And each a fatty acid, which is a long you know, thing that's connected to that, is connected by an ester bond. So uh, when, when this comes into the cell, it's often uh, transported either from a calomicron, which is you know the, the structure, it's like a little delivery vehicle that the uh, body makes to deliver the fatty acids uh, to the cells initially, or uh, it could become from the uh, either high density lip, I'm not, sorry, not high density, the low density lipoprotein or the very low density lipoprotein, which is made in the liver. And so these are then packaged inside there. And why are they packaged inside there is because this whole business uh, is nonpolar and the, the blood is polar. It's a kind of like water-based type of medium and a uh, fat-based medium is uh, the other kind. So since these are fats and they don't get along in the blood all that well by themselves, at least in this, this length, then they need to be transported. And so they're transported by one of those two mechanisms into the cell and they're put in. And then the cell maybe uses some of these fatty acids. Well, it might need it for, you know, making more membrane or it might need it for other purposes. So they remove this, uh, this fatty acid, they maybe take the second one off and the third one. And then what we're left with is a coat hanger. Well, actually it's the triglyceride. No, it's not. It's the glycerol from tri triglycerides. Sometimes when you're looking at diagrams or little charts and things, they'll have TAG as the abbreviation for triglycerides. And they're abbreviating it triacyl glycerol. So that's where the TAG comes from. That's just a little side note. So last time we were talking about NATO. <laughs> so I was trying to figure out, you know, uh, how do we how do we use this? And, and you know, d does our body make it or do we bring it in? I didn't know when I was talking about it before that we, we don't, the basic bare um, ingredient usually comes in with food, like a green plant, would give us uh, the vitamin K1, that form of it. And then in the body, there's another uh, mechanism where a, another part is added to that. It's called prenylation. And it's, it's kind of like having a, an extra longer part added to the molecule. So that prenylation results in in our bodies in vitamin K2 and then version MK4. Now, natto makes vitamin K2, MK7, which is, has just a little bit longer chain. And it appears that in the body that this can be shifted back and forth, but it is done so in the presence of an, an enzyme system. Now, I like abbreviations just like everybody else does, you know. Instead of saying citric acid cycle, you'd, you'd have some other TCA, whatever, however they call it. Um, and when you when you have those abbreviations, it's like HMG uh, CoA. 
so hydroxymethylglutarol coenzyme A, and the enzyme involved in conversion of that is the hydroxymethylglutarol coenzyme A reductase. So they just say HMG-CoA or HMG-CR. It's a lot easier to say that. <laughs> Not everybody can say the other. In fact, I had to put it on a teleprompter just to be able to read it to you. Okay, so where are we going with this? Besides having no idea, I, I actually had an idea and it was a plan, you know. I, I ran across something where people were talking about natto and making vitamin uh, K1 into K2 or whatever. And then it was actually a group from Japan that had written kind of a review paper on it and various structures and methods and so forth. And then they, they had a, they made a statement about statin drugs inhibiting the conversion of K1 into K2. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> statins get a, another bad name for another reason. And so, you know, I tried to look into that and understand it better. And um, yeah, it it also, I mean, you know, the statin inhibits the HMG, uh, coact HMGCR. It, it it inhibits that because there's a whole um, there's a whole downstream to that which results in cholesterol. So the statin is trying to reduce the amount of cholesterol made in the liver. So it shuts that system down. And that system also produces uh, something called ubiquinone, which is also called CoQ10, which is used in the electron transport chain mechanism as part of that. So you need that in order to have the electron transport chain working, which is where we get most of the energy when we get, when we use oxygen to make energy in our, in our mitochondria, that's where most of the energy comes from. So we have an, an an inhibition by the statin of doing something that we might want to have. Vitamin K was originally uh, called vitamin K because there was something in the food that they were looking at that were feeding test animals that stopped coagulation of the blood. I mean, I'm sorry, I said it backwards. It, it, it created coagulation in the blood if you got cut or injured or something like that. You want your blood to coagulate. Yeah, if I make a cut on my finger, I don't want it to keep bleeding. <laughs> That's not a healthy thing. So vitamin K was determined that that was related to it, and it was probably the K1 form. Now, the K2 does more things, and it, it appears that there's something called osteocalcin, which is a, a molecule to help take calcium and put it into bones. And if it's carboxylated, which the vitamin K2 does to it, it works better. It, it was able to place that calcium into the bone more effectively and in a proper way. So the thoughts about osteoporosis as far as being a vitamin K2 as being a pre preventive from that disease going forward is because of that osteocalcin carboxylation. Now there's another molecule that's involved in the calcium that gets into our arteries. And uh, my wife had uh, some CT scans recently and showed her lower abdomen. And they were, they were looking for something. I won't talk about her health history, but just say that you could see little spots of calcium here and there. <laughs> they showed up white on, the, on the, the scan. And I don't know if those are necessarily something we'd want to have, get more of, especially in our, our, uh, our blood vessels, our, our arteries in particular. Uh, now, there's a very generous person who makes videos and teaches people like me and others on the web. His name is Ford Brewer. He's a, a preventive medicine doc. Um, I think his company might be called PrevMed. And I certainly have learned a lot from him, and I think there's a lot to benefit. Uh, he questions whether or not we want to start removing calcium from our arteries. But there is a molecule, Matrix GLA protein, that is do, does that, and it does that under the uh, again, needs to be carboxylated by vitamin K2. So if if our statin is interfering with vitamin K2 formation, you know, we can't convert it, uh, that's not going to be helpful if we're trying to reduce the amount of calcium in our arteries. Again, you know, uh, Ford Brewer questions whether that's a good thing or a bad thing to, to remove it, but I'm going to leave that up to you folks to learn about. Consider what he has to say talk to your own doctors, 
uh, you may want to take this for that, or maybe not. But even, even if it was just a matter of building your bones better, and a lot of older people, and you know, which is, I guess that's what I'm getting into that category, a lot of older people have problems with their, um, their bones breaking when they fall, or even breaking and then they fall, you know. So I don't want to go there. I don't want to be part of that. So we have, we have statin uh, inhibiting this important process of conversion so that we, we can use the vitamin K2 everywhere in our body. Now, there's a very uh, wise man named Bruce Ames, and uh, he has studied nutrition, and he's up at, um, I believe, well, let's just say in Northern California. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to blame the wrong school if I get the wrong school. So I'll just say he's in Northern California. Very generous man, uh, a very kind man who has shared on. I mean, you'll find him. Uh, Rhonda Patrick has interviewed him. She's done a good job. She used to be one of his students. In fact, uh, I think he he praises her very highly, and she she uh, is worthy of praise. So he talks about the triage theory in terms of nutrition. And he says that in, in the body, some, some things have priority. The body chooses some things to have priority as far as what it makes. If it doesn't have enough of something, it will keep what's necessary and other tissues might suffer. And that could be what's happening with vitamin K2. Maybe the liver needs it and it needs it for various reasons. And then the bones and the blood vessels don't get the attention. So if you're on statins, and you also are concerned about getting older and not having broken bones, you might want to talk to your doctor about that. Whether it, I mean, it also appears that cholesterol itself is not, not the bad guy. <laughs> you know, I mean, that this is not to argue that one way or another, but just to consider it. Now, there is another drug which is used in, in the management often of diabetes called metformin. I don't know a lot about metformin. I think it's about 40 years old. Uh, and it also is an inhibitor of the same uh, enzyme that converts the uh, vitamin K1 to K2. So it would be something to think about. Th there are some people that are even advocating metformin in a low dose to either prevent cancer or to uh, maybe uh, add in longevity in some way. But the broken bones and the calcified arteries aren't going to be helpful. So since it also interferes with that same you know, HMG-CR enzyme, I think it's something I wouldn't necessarily want to use unless I really needed it. Now, one of the things about metformin is that it's a, a complex 1 inhibitor. And the complex 1 inhibitors that I know about include metformin, something called berberine, which I sometimes take uh, in between my fasting mimicking diet cycles, redneck version, of course, and uh, pawpaw cell reg is another complex one inhibitor. And there's an interesting video by the man who uh, worked with uh, the acetogenins in pawpaw for many years on my same channel here, and you can listen to Dr. Jerry McLaughlin talk about his life's work. Let's get back to this now. So we have complex one being interfered with Complex one is where the if we if we are into a state of really low blood sugar, we're we're going to need to have complex one working. So anything like metformin, berberine, or pawpaw, I wouldn't use during my fasting mimicking diet cycle or the rebuild period afterwards, which has turned out for me to be about seven days. Now I'm 67. And I know that that's kind of at the edge of what uh, Dr. Walter Longo recommends for his product, the Prolon, somewhere between 65 and 70 is, is kind of the limit. And then after that, he doesn't really recommend it until they know more, until they have millions and millions of people using it, then they'll, they'll be able to know better how it's working. I hope that you have enjoyed listening to me, or maybe <laughs> at least if you're still here, you haven't turned me off yet. But... Um, just be considerate about your your life and your, your diet and what you're taking and the drugs. And uh, try to come to an understanding of what they're doing. Uh, I know that metformin and also berberine, if it's interfering with 
sugar production through the electron transport system, that means it's basically using up the sugar in a very inefficient way by either called glycolysis, that's the term they use today, or fermentation was the old term that I might have learned years ago. So fermentation is good if you're making beer, if you're uh, making wine, but if you're you're trying to use energy in the body, it's it's like comparing my Prius, which I drive today, to my 1985 Suburban three-quarter ton. I don't think I ever got better than about nine miles to the gallon with that vehicle. But my Prius, you know, without trying too hard, I can get between 43 and 48 miles per gallon. And which is the better way to use sugar? Well, if, you're, if your sugar is just completely blown out and you've got it everywhere and you've got to get rid of it as fast as possible... Sure, metformin or berberine would be a very efficient way to use up the sugar because it's using that really inefficient way of, of burning it. But when it gets really down to it, we want to um, take better care. Now let's talk about how do we make beta-hydroxybutyrate or acetoacetate from a substrate. If we have the HMG-CoA, we can take two of the, the uh, acyl-CoA uh, structures and combine them into one. And, and we use that enzyme to, to do that, the HMGCR. Uh, I mean, there's probably a bunch of stuff involved with it besides that, but you didn't come to listen to me because I'm a chemist. <laughs> and the beta-hydroxybutyrate is kind of the more stable form, they say, people say, and the acetoacetate is the more unstable form. So, but they get created in the liver, they get sent out to other places in the body, and eventually the beta-hydroxybutyrate or BHB will uh, go in, make acetoacetate, and which then will make acetone. And acetone is the end product, basically. And so uh, that first month, on the morning of day uh, three, I, had a taste of acetone in my mouth. I happened to know what it tasted like. And so I knew that I was making beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. And I had through the night somehow. So uh, that having been said, I think I've rattled on a bunch of stuff and I just want to say thank you for listening. Again, I'm Richard Lund uh, on my journey to live 100 healthy years. And I will give you my, my sign-off as May you live a hundred healthy years and enjoy them all.